been duplicated, never replicated. You're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network. KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network, visit our website at www.oneblueraven.weebly.com. Good morning and welcome to the January 26, 2014 edition of FOJC Radio Church. I am David Carey Cole and for the next two hours we are going to be studying the Word of God. Our lesson this morning is the Three Suppers of Christ. The Three Suppers of Christ. And we're going to be looking at the ministry of Jesus in a way that is, I believe, is going to open up some insights into Jesus and what he did in a way that we've never looked at it quite like this before. And we are also going to be celebrating the Passover this morning, probably in the second hour, and you can get together your elements you need, your juice, or your wine mixed with water, and your unleavened bread, and we'll be doing that in the second hour hour and that's certainly always a celebration so we as we do we are going to worship the Lord this morning and focus our minds okay can you hear us now people in the chat are telling we're having problems coming through how am I coming across now is that okay all right well I'll, I'll repeat uh, the essence of what I've said. We these uh, little glitches. They're great when they work, but there's always these little surprises with live radio. But our lesson this morning is the three suppers of Christ, 
and we're going to be looking at the ministry of Christ in a unique and a fresh way this morning. And I believe it's going to give us insight into what Jesus did in a way that make us think about some things that we've probably not thought about before. And in the second hour, we're going to be celebrating the Passover and get together your your juice or your wine mixed with water and your unleavened bread. And we'll be having that celebration in the second hour. And as we do, we're going to worship the Lord this morning. Before we pray and begin our lesson, and let's focus our minds on Him for just a few moments this morning. We'll be right back. Amen. And we're going to go to prayer this morning, as we do. The first scripture we're going to read is going to be in the Gospel of Luke, the 13th chapter the 28th and 29th verses if you want to be turning there and we just want to say that wherever you are in the world this morning we welcome you and we're so thankful that you're studying with us this morning and let's pray Heavenly Father we do thank you for this chance to come together and we just ask Lord your richest blessings on those this morning that are going to partake in your word and of your Passover feast and Lord we just ask that you help me this morning to bring forth your word help Donna and just help each and every one of us this morning to receive that which is from you and we give you the praise in Jesus name amen and amen Luke chapter 13 verse 28 and 29 we're going to be talking about the three suppers of Christ there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God and Jesus here is telling the religious leaders of Israel that they're going to miss out and they're not going to get to sit down with the Old Testament prophets because what they're doing isn't what they were doing and it looks forward to the Gentiles coming down and sitting down at that great banquet feast with the Old Testament patriarchs and so much of scripture and we've talked about this on a lot of occasions has to do with this idea of that true communion, that true feast with God. The human race began with eating the things of the garden that God said that they could eat. And they went wrong when they ate the wrong thing. We've talked about the mystery religions, how that the mystery religions had the feast to their pagan gods, the false communion. And we talked about how in the Old Testament that the people of God ate of their tithe, My goodness, you're not going to hear that. (laughs) But they ate of their tithe, and they rejoiced in a feast before the Lord. The tithe was meant to be a celebration and a feast before God. And we've talked about how that when the Lord returns, there will be the wedding supper of the Lamb. And this is what this scripture in Luke that we read looks forward to, that one day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would be excluded from this banquet, but the Gentiles, which is most of you and I are Gentiles, and we will get to come and sit down in the kingdom. And of course, an ethnic Jew can come too, but they must come the way of faith in Christ. Now, I have known, and I'm sure that you have as well, that on one occasion, Jesus fed the 5,000, and that on another occasion... He fed the 4,000. And that right before he was crucified, he celebrated the Passover feast. There were three distinct suppers in the ministry of Christ. The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, and the final Passover supper that he celebrated with his disciples. Now we know this, but I've never before understood the significance of it that Each of these three suppers 
closed out a distinctive phase in the ministry of Christ. Now, let me explain. The feeding of the 5,000, this concluded Jesus' ministry in northern Israel, in Galilee, around the, the city of Capernaum, where he had his headquarters. And when he closed out his ministry in Galilee, he fed the 5,000. But what people aren't being told is then Jesus left the country. We get the picture of there's so much in the Hebraic Roots Movement that talks about the Jewish Jesus, and Jesus was ethnically a Jew, and how that Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he certainly did. But Jesus ministered to thousands of Gentiles, and after he fed the 5,000, he left the country. And there were two ministry trips that Jesus had that were out of the country of Israel. They were in Syria, in the region that was called the Decapolis. And when Jesus fed the 4,000, this was at the conclusion of his ministry in Syria, in the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis, Deca means ten. And there were ten cities, and we're talking about the land east of the Jordan River. In the Old Testament, this times, this was the land of Og, the king of Bashan, the Rephaim giant, the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. This is where Balaam and Balak tried to curse Israel before they crossed the Jordan River and went into the land of Canaan. And when Jesus fed the 4,000, this was to the Gentiles. Now, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And this is really a mind-blowing paradigm. And we're going to be talking about more about Jesus' ministry in the Decapolis. It went, uh, the Decapolis went in the north all the way to Damascus. And in the south, it went to the city of Philadelphia, which was one of the cities of the seven churches, Gergesa, where Jesus confronted the uh, cast-out devils. And also in Gadara, uh, there was the casting out of devils. These were two cities of the Decapolis. And we're going to talk more about that later. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the gospel was given to the Jew first. And what the Apostle Paul would do, he would go into a city, he'd go into the synagogue, they'd try to kill him, and then he'd go to the Gentiles. This was the basic pattern of Paul. And this was the way with Jesus also. And at the conclusion of his ministry in Galilee, they had just killed John the Baptist, and Herod was now focusing on killing him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were in his face, and at that time, it wasn't his time to die yet. And he left the country and went into the Decapolis. And there were two trips into the Decapolis, and we're going to look at this in a lot more detail later, because this brings out an understanding of Jesus that is being misrepresented in the modern evangelical church. But then, the, the feeding of the 5,000 concluded his Galilean ministry. The feeding of the 4,000 concluded his ministry in the Decapolis. And when he celebrated the, the Passover right before he died, this concluded his ministry in southern Israel in Judea. So these three suppers concluded the three geographical campaigns of Jesus. And that's so tremendously significant. And it brings into focus the importance of the true communion versus the false. And how the, the big picture of God's program is to lead his people into the true communion. Not just the celebration which we will be celebrating this morning but the actual right relationship with the living God and we're going to look first this morning at the feeding of the 5,000 and this is something that is found in all four Gospels 
It's found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the 6th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the 9th of Luke, and in the 6th chapter of John. And what we're going to do this morning, we're going to take the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to compare those two stories of the feeding of the 5,000, and we're going to learn some amazing things, as we always do when we go to the Word of God. Now let's go to John chapter 6. And as I said, this is taking place at the conclusion of the Galilean ministry of Jesus, which took place in the north. And in Israel, you have in the north the Sea of Galilee. And the Jordan River flows from the Sea of Galilee. It gets its headwaters in Carcerea Philippi in the north. And the Jordan River flows from north to the south, and it flows into the Dead Sea in the south. And of course, this is the boundary line. They crossed over the Jordan to go into the Promised Land. Now, this is what Jesus does right before he leaves the country. Now, let's go to John chapter 6, and let's read the first four verses. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them which were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jew, Jews, was nigh. And the people that participated in the feeding of the 5,000, these were Jewish Passover pilgrims. They were. It was the time of the Passover. In uh, the Gospel of Mark, Mark mentions the green grass. And it was very soon after the Passover that there was no green grass in northern Israel. So this is the Passover pilgrims. They are on their way to celebrate the Passover feast in Jerusalem, but they get an opportunity to partake of a meal that is greater than the Passover feast. Now, in Mark, let's look at the Gospel of Mark, and let's read chapter 6, and let's read verses 39 and 40, and this is just so marvelous. Mark chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Now, the Greek word for sit down, anaklino, is the word that was used for sitting down at a banquet. And this banquet of God is very much in view here. Now the word for grass is the word chortos and that's the word for garden. So he is having them sit down to a banquet in the garden and if you look at how Jesus did this and it says he made them to sit down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties in little orderly blocks and if you would have looked at how Jesus arranged these people and that word for grass literally is the word you would use for a garden bed and if you would have looked at these people from the top of the hill they would have looked like a garden because the people were literally arranged in little garden beds and the people uh, wore bright colored clothes at this time. And if you would have looked at them, they would have looked like a garden. And literally, the people would have looked like a garden on the, the, on the side of, of the hill. And this is just so much what Jesus is all about. He is about drawing his people into the garden and we've talked about this and we talked about the song of Solomon about how Jesus is wooing his bride into the garden and here these Passover pilgrims that were looking to go to the Passover they are treated to something so much better and of course 
everything in Jesus' ministry, the big picture of the whole plan of God is the true communion versus the false. And here Jesus is sitting his people down in the garden. And what a powerful picture we have here of what Jesus is doing. Now, Mark chapter 6, let's begin in verse 27, and let's read the text. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison. And this is speaking about John Baptist. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither of all the cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now, as I said, the the situation in Galilee, Herod had just killed John the Baptist. The blood of the Baptist was still in the nostrils of Herod. And now he was turning his focus toward Christ. The Pharisees were in his face doing everything they could to trip him up and to bring him to his death. And John the Baptist, he was a true spiritual leader. And after his death, the people were lost, so to speak. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And John the Baptist, he said, I am not worthy to tie the shoes of this one that is coming. How much we need leadership now in America that will not point to themselves but will point to Christ and lift him up. That's what true spiritual leadership would do. And if there was ever a time that the people in America were like sheep without a shepherd, it is now. But just as then... Jesus has compassion on those that have no spiritual leadership and he will be a personal spiritual leader to you if you will allow him to be and every true spiritual shepherd will not point to themselves but they will point to Christ and they will point tell people how they can be taught of the Lord now Jesus responds to hunger and desire. These people were on the way to the Passover, yet they followed Jesus into the desert beyond the place where they had food and provisions to feed themselves to get out of the desert. Jesus will respond if you have hunger and desire. If you do not, you can just stay lazy and stay stupid. You cannot cast out stupid. And spiritual desire is something that I cannot put in your heart. It has to come from the Lord. You either love the Lord or you do not. But if you do love God and you do desire truth and you do desire Christ, He will respond to your spiritual hunger. But then as now, to respond to Christ meant you had to depart from the leadership of Israel, spiritually speaking. And we are at a place in America to really follow Christ. You're going to have to depart from the majority and pretty much all of the recognized leadership of the Christian church in America today. That's a bad thing to say, but it's absolutely true. Now, Mark chapter 6, verse 35, let's read on in our text. It says, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. 
He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves. And he gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And you cannot miss the similarity between praying for the loaf and distributing it just like he did at the final Passover. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragment and out of the fishes. And of course the twelve is tremendously significant. The twelve is signifying that they are now the, the twelve apostles become or or excuse me, the twelve tribes of Israel are now replaced by the twelve apostles of Jesus Christ and they were soon to move from the celebration of the Old Testament Passover into the Israel of God keeping the Passover feast as Jesus meant it to be. Now, let's read some scriptures. Let's read three concerning this fact because there's so much confusion about uh, Israel. Uh, There are even many today that are teaching dual covenant theology. They say that a Jew can be saved by keeping the Old Testament covenant without coming to faith in Christ. And this is just an absolute lie. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. To become a member of the Israel of God, you have to place your faith in Jesus Christ, in his death on the cross, being the payment for your sin, repenting of your sin, placing your faith in him. And that's what it takes to become a member of the Israel of God. And in Galatians 3.28, The scripture says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. You see, nationalities go. You see, there really isn't anything, any such creature, as a messianic Jew. Because to be, uh, for a Jew, to become a part of the Israel of God, they have to cease to be a Jew. You see, we lose our ethnic identity. Our ethnicity does not matter. We become a new creature. Paul talked about the new man in Ephesians 2. And there's neither male nor female. There, there's, there's neither Jew nor, nor Greek. Neither Jew nor Gentile. So this is what the Israel of God is. And, and let's read Romans chapter 2 while we're on this. Because this is just so horrifically misrepresented in the, the modern spirit of the American evangelical church. But Romans 2.28 says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And it's interesting that when Jesus fed the 4,000, there were seven basketfuls taken up. Twelve being... The, the number of the twelve tribes of Israel transitioning to the twelve apostles, seven, and here again in the feeding of the four thousand, these were predominantly Gentiles, and seven being God's perfect number and also the number of the church, the seven churches, which the, Jesus addressed, meaning the seven whole churches. So this is just so loaded with symbolic and spiritual truth that these three suppers are are just a tremendous summation of the purpose and the heart of what Jesus did to bring Jew and Gentile unto himself, who is the true Passover lamb who was shed for the sins of the world. Now, let's go back to John chapter 6. 
And it's time for our first break this morning. So before we do that, we're going to take our first break. And we are going to be coming right back this morning on FJJC Radio Church. We'll be right back. Amen. Let's look at John chapter 6 and verse 15. And as I say, in the feeding of the 5,000, we're going to go back and forth between John chapter 6 and Mark chapter 6 to get the full picture of all that's going on. Um, John chapter 6 and verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now, you you just have to put yourself in Jesus' place here. He had just fed the 5,000, and as we said, Herod and the, the government officials, Herod had just killed John the Baptist, and now he was looking toward Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing everything they could to get into his face and trip him up. And now the people that loved him, they wanted to make him king. They totally misunderstood that Jesus' Messiahship was not to set up a kingdom, throw the Romans out and set up a Christian Israel, but his kingdom was in the hearts of men. Now, what Jesus did here is so is something we don't want to miss. Now, let's go back to the Gospel of Mark, and let's read Mark chapter 6 and verse 45. And after I read this, I'm going to show you what Jesus did. When, you know, and what would you do? Everybody... Almost everybody following you misunderstood what you wanted to do and were trying to make him king. The Pharisees and the Sadducees in his face, Herod wanting to kill him. Well, I'm going to show you what Jesus did. But I want to show you this in Mark chapter 6, verse 45. This is so powerful. It says here, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And that word constrained, that means that Jesus compelled them even to the point of force. That is making somebody do something. That's like when your little child doesn't want to do something, and you just grab a hold of them and take them when they don't want to leave some place and you just constrain them to go do it. And Jesus did not want his disciples to be in this revolutionary atmosphere. There is so much in the modern day Christian remnant movement that's revolutionary. That is the same spirit that wants to go to insurrection. Jesus was not an insurrectionist. He believed in self-defense. We could establish that. But he was not for insurrection throwing over the government and making himself a king. And he forced his disciples to get out of this atmosphere. And as soon as he sent the people away, he left the country. He did not want his presence to in any way enhanced the idea that he was about overthrowing the government and becoming king himself and he made his disciples get in the boat and get out of there and that is so telling and if the modern remnant movement would learn that lesson it would be certainly a marvelous thing now let's go back to the gospel of John chapter 6 and we have Jesus with Herod wanting to kill him, the Pharisees doing everything they could to aggravate him. Every, most everybody misunderstanding what he was all about. What did Jesus do? Well, let's look what Jesus did. He taught the Word. And let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 35. And let's look what Jesus did. He did this teaching. John chapter 6 verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, 
I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus claimed to be that true bread that came down from heaven, and in verse 40, John chapter 6 and verse 40, he says how we partake of that bread. In verse 40 he said, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. We partake of the bread of heaven by our faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus did not say, If you interpret me correctly, you'll have eternal life. But he said, believe. When you start interpreting what Jesus said, you're always going to be wrong. He is to be believed. We have to believe him. What Jesus said isn't up for a vote. When Jesus said what he said, you have two choices. You can either believe it or you can disbelieve it. It's it's just that simple. And Jesus said, you people that are going every different direction like a sheep without a shepherd you think this you think that he said I am the bread of life if you believe on me you'll have eternal life and I'll raise you up in the last day and you'll sit down at that great banquet of God one day now let's go to John chapter 6 and let's look what he said beginning in chapter 53. And when Jesus had a crowd, you know, boy, if this would have been one of the modern tele-evangelists, if you had a crowd of 5,000 people, you'd do everything you could to make that crowd feel good, to make that crowd think that you're the, the greatest thing since peanut butter and jelly, and of course, to get a real good offering out of that crowd. But listen to what Jesus did. John chapter 6 and verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And in verse 40, Jesus had told them how they eat of that bread. It's through believing on him. Jesus did not want these people to come up and bite him. And, you know, our good Roman Catholic friends, they believe that uh, in transubstantiation, that the blood, uh, that the wine and the bread literally become the body and blood of Christ. Of course, this would be cannibalism. And all of the Old Testament law forbid the drinking of blood. This is obviously not what Jesus meant. And in verse 40, he said that it is by faith you partake of this bread. But many, many people are misled into believing in transubstantiation and beyond transubstantiation the false prophet is going to celebrate a Luciferian mass of transmutation the mass of the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13 and as the marriage supper of the Lamb is the ultimate fulfillment of the true communion in Revelation 13 when one of the popes of Rome will one day stand uh, under Benini's canopy and lift up that Luciferian host that will be the ultimate fulfillment of the false communion it's all about which communion you're going to be a part of and to be a part of the true communion you have to eat and drink the flesh of Christ now, we're going to talk about that. Now, in John chapter 6, 6, 6, 
John chapter 6, verse 66. Do you believe anything is coincidence in the Word of God? No, it's not. 666, the number of the beast, and John 666, it reads, From that time, many of his disciples went back, apostasia, and walked no more with him. When Jesus had the big crowd, he put forth, his sternest, plainest teaching. He made it clear that to follow him was to believe on him and to believe every part of Jesus. You see, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, to believe on him, that is how we must believe. We must take everything that Jesus said and did and we must encompass that and embrace it and most people today just like in that day almost all of the 5,000 they were saying Jesus we love you but they were doing their own thing and we have to eat and drink everything that Jesus did let me let's just look at a few things and let's just ask ourselves if we can eat them Uh, John chapter 13 verse 35 Jesus said this by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another can you eat that one the supreme thing that marks you as a Christian is the love that you have toward other Christians can you eat that one Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. A lot of people stumble at that. They have they say Jesus, but they're not very loving. Mark Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. And I am a little slow this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Can you eat that one? And many times there's much we could say about forgiveness that that's a difficult thing sometimes. But Jesus said we have to love, we have to forgive. And let's look at Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 23 let's look at what Jesus said and this is exactly what Jesus meant as he addressed that crowd you've got to believe on me and you got to believe on me you just can't say Jesus and then fill in the blanks you've got to eat and drink me and in John and in Luke chapter 9 beginning in verse 23 And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what advantage is a man, for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels now taking up your cross is much we could say about that but in verse 26 it says that you cannot be ashamed of Jesus or of his words and take part of taking up your cross and of eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus is eating his words and there are many there's examples from Jeremiah Ezekiel and John the Revelator of a prophetic experience where the prophet in the spirit actually ate the words of God and this is what Jesus is talking about whenever we reject the words of Jesus 
and we fill in the blanks for ourselves. Whether it's on love, whether it's on forgiveness, whether it's on anything that Jesus said. And the favorite darling dandy doctrines of the American church, I could just mention to the, the pre-trib rapture and once saved, always saved, you cannot believe the words of Jesus and believe these doctrines at the same time. And we could do complete lessons on both of those subjects. But eating part of eating the flesh and blink, drinking the blood of Jesus is eating his words and standing where Jesus stood. Can you eat the flesh and drink the blood? Now, let's go to John chapter 8 and let's look at verse 43. And there are some very, very serious things here. And celebrating the Passover is a serious thing. John chapter 8 verse 43. Jesus said, Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. And it's amazing to me. You know, Jesus said, I'm coming after the tribulation. And people will say, Well, I don't know when Jesus is coming, before or after in the middle. And, uh, you know, don't get me started. Jesus said that the tares are coming out before the wheat. Of course, Preachers today, they say the wheat's coming out before the tares. Why can't you hear Jesus' word? Verse 44, he said, Year of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Verse 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus is hearing His words and believing them. Just like the prophets had that we, we could read a lot of scriptures, do a whole lesson on those supernatural prophetic experiences where the prophets would literally eat the word of God. Now, let's go to Jeremiah. And I read the book of Jeremiah through this week. And what was so amazing, what really jumped out to me, was this phrase that I'm going to talk to you about that ties in just exactly with what we're studying this morning. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next few scriptures that the broken cistern that Jeremiah is talking about is your own mind. And the process is like this. When you reject the words of Jesus, which are the words of God, and you substitute your own ideas and your own words at this point it is walking in the imagination of your own mind and this is the phrase that Jeremiah used repeatedly when people reject the words of God and Jesus said that talked about the doctrines of men the Holy Spirit can only take you to the words of Christ we've put together many times 1 John 2.27 with John 14.26 to explain the teaching ministry of the Holy Ghost, how it will take you back to the words of Christ. And if you're not doing that, you are walking in the doctrines of men and in the imagination of your own mind. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 10 and this will show us that 
the broken cistern that Jeremiah was talking about was the mind that rejects the words of God and substitutes their own idea. Jeremiah 13.10 This evil people which refuse to hear my words and walk in the imagination of their heart. Now that's exactly what it is. When you refuse the words of Jesus and you substitute your own ideas, you are no longer being led by the Holy Spirit, but you are walking in the imagination of your own heart. And let's look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. And let's look at verse 24. It says, But they inclined not, nor in, excuse me, but they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. In Jeremiah 7.27, Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished, and is cut off from their mouth. And the thing about people that are walking in the imagination of their own heart you can tell them what Jesus said. Just for instance, Jesus said, I'm coming after the tribulation. But a person walking in the imagination of their own heart, they won't hear that. Their ear cannot hear that because they are not being led by the Holy Spirit. They have replaced God's words with their own ideas. They go into the doctrines of men and the imagination of whatever their heart or those men want to add or replace the words of Christ with. Now, in in Proverbs chapter 14, and verse 12, there is that very, very profound scripture. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that is exactly talking about the same thing. When you substitute what you think is right for what the Word of God says, that's a way of death. That's not a way of life. That's not going to turn out good for you. But the pride of man does not want to take correction. Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That means that you love that means that you forgive. That means that you take what I say and you believe that. Don't interpret it. You believe it. That is the way into the current communion. And Jesus said, few there will be that find it. Because the gratification that the carnal man gets from walking in the counsels of his own mind and the imagination of his own heart that so gratifies his ego that he will not humble himself to take correction from the word of God. And this is a sure path to the way of death. Let's hear Jeremiah a little more. Let's hear Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 13 and 14. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 13 and 14. And the Lord saith, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Now here, the Israelites the imagination of their heart took them to the Balaams. But the imagination of some people's hearts takes them to Islam. Uh, the imagination of some people's hearts will take them to Buddhism. The imagination of many people's hearts takes them to apostate Christianity, which names the name of Jesus, but rejects his words and refuses to eat them. The imagination of the heart 
can take you in many different directions, the words of Jesus Christ will take you only one direction. The leading of the Holy Spirit will take you only one direction. And that is back unto the Lord. Now we're going to take a break here at the top of the hour. And when we come back, we're just going to be reading a few more scriptures, concluding our thoughts. And then we will be celebrating the Passover here in our second hour. Probably not too far into it. So in this break, get your elements ready. And we are going to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. Celebrate the Passover and focus our faith on Him. And allow the Holy Spirit to lift us up, bless our hearts, take us into the garden this morning. Where we can have that true feast that truly enriches the soul. We'll be right back. Often duplicated, never replicated. You're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network. Desert Southwest, out here in the Rockies, you're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network. Thank you for listening. KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network. Visit our website at www.1blueraven.com. just going to read a few scriptures here to conclude our thoughts and draw our thoughts to a focus and then we're going to go right in we're going to then we'll have a song to give you a final moment to get together your elements and then we're going to celebrate the Passover but Jeremiah 11 and 8 Jeremiah 11 and 8 he said yet they obeyed not nor inclined their ear but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do but they did them not not hearing the words of God is disobedience and that brings you under the judgment of God and in Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23 Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And this is just a parallel to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8 when he said, the carnal mind is enmity against God. There's no way the carnal mind can please God. In your mind you have no capacity to find the ways of God to please Him in any way. You have to come to the place where you repent of going your own way and say, yes, I will follow Jesus. 
I will eat his flesh and drink his blood, and wherever the words of the Savior take me, I will not be ashamed of them, but I will follow him. And in Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 3, And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Many, many people are under a curse because they have knowingly rejected the words of God and substituted in their place the doctrines of men and the ideas of their own mind. And by the way, the word Antichrist, anti, in the Greek lexicon, the number one primary meaning of anti is in place of. The number two lexical meaning is against. And that's what the Antichrist goal and the spirit of Antichrist is to replace the words of Jesus with something else. And that's something that is wholesale. Only that called out remnant are going to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Because then as now, to follow Jesus, or I guess I should say now as then, to follow Jesus meant to depart from that which is popular, and it necessitated a departure from that which is popular. And in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, the religious leaders of Israel in the days of Christ, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were in his face doing everything they could to oppose him. They uh, were instrumental in bringing him to his death. But yet they would argue from sun up to sundown that they were God's little warriors and that they knew the ways of God. And so it is with people that walk after the imagination of their own heart. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, the prophet said this, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And don't underestimate the capacity of your own heart to deceive you. You must anchor yourself in the words of Jesus. And when Jesus says something, eat it and drink it. Follow him. Eternal life and true communion isn't about this group or about that group or about this man or about that man. I am least than nothing and all I can do this morning is point you to Jesus Christ to eat his flesh and drink his blood because there you'll find eternal life and there you will find the true communion. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 And there's much parallel in the 8th chapter of Romans with that which we talked about in the book of Jeremiah. But we'll just read Romans 8 and 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And as we said before, the Holy Spirit will teach you and take you back to what Jesus said. I want to return to John chapter 14 verse 26. And I think we're going to read that. And I might read one more. But I want to read the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 26. And Jesus said here, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost will take you back to what Jesus said. The Holy Ghost will not take you to a doctrine of man. The Holy Ghost will not anoint the words of man and the imagination of the heart. The anointing of the Holy Ghost goes to Jesus. It lifts him up and it takes you to what he said. Now, 
our last scripture before our song is going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. And this is a good focus point for all we've said thus far. In John, chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. This tells us how you're going to be judged at the end of your life. This is going to be what determines whether you're going to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb or not. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The words of Jesus, and whether we received them or rejected them, that's how we're going to be judged. That's what determines whether you're led by the Holy Spirit or whether you're walking in the imagination of your own mind. Now, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for this chance to come together and have this fellowship via the internet in FOJC Radio Church. Father, I just pray that we now examine our hearts and we examine our minds. And Lord, if there be any part of Jesus that we have refused to eat, whether it be of love, and Lord, we know we fall so short in loving as we should, Lord, we know that we fail. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness and for your help to love as we really should. And to forgive. Lord, you you told us about forgiveness. And Lord, just help us to forgive. We ought against any this morning as we examine our hearts. And Lord, you told us that we can't be ashamed of your words. And Lord, if we're ashamed of anything you said this morning, Lord, just give us the boldness of the Holy Ghost to stand for you and what you said this morning, Lord, and let us stand with you wherever that will take us, whatever, for whatever rejection or for whatever friends we'd lose. Lord, we'll know we'll find the true remnant of God and we'll find the true communion if we truly eat your flesh and drink your blood this morning. So, Father, we just pray that you just help us all to examine our hearts and we give you the praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we're going to have a song now. And as we have this song, we just ask that you examine your heart and that you prepare yourself to celebrate the Passover. And we will do that right after this song. We'll be right back. Amen indeed going to read our scripture from Mark the 14th chapter in Mark chapter 14 and the 12th verse and the first day of unleavened bread when they killed the Passover his disciples said unto him where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover and as we've been emphasizing here in our studies that when we celebrate this supper we are keeping the Passover in the book of Exodus the the scripture said that the Passover was to be for a perpetual memorial and now as we keep the Passover we don't do it as they did in the Old Testament but as Paul said Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us and we're celebrating this morning the birth of the new Israel as the old as the first Passover it, it it celebrated the deliverance of Israel and the the protection from the destroyer likewise this celebrates and it ensures to us the birth of the new Israel and the protection from the destroyer that will that will soon return and in Mark chapter 14 verse 18 Jesus said and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, 
One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. So, let's take the bread this morning. This bread represents the the body of Christ. And as we take it, let's just make that commitment in our heart that we're going to take Jesus. We're not going to take a part of Him. But we're going to take Him in His his totality. Wherever that might take us is going to be fine. Let's take our bread this morning. Thank you, Lord. Now let's drink of the cup this morning together. Let us drink. And as we do, we just have in our mind that we're eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus. That by faith, all of Jesus we're taking this morning. Let us drink together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just worship you this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that the presence of God can unite us. Even though we're all over the world, we can feel together your presence this morning. And we thank you for your presence. Lord, you said if you're, as Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go. But wherever your presence takes us, we will be able to go. So Lord, we just want to say this morning that we just want to pray a special blessing in the name of Jesus upon each and every one listening this morning. The presence and the favor of God. May you be richly blessed from that feast in the garden. May he draw you into his presence that you will just be enriched and blessed by our great Savior. Now we're going to close in a word of prayer this morning. And Donna has two songs to play. And we can just just spend a little time here in His presence. And I just want to say that I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining this morning in FOJC Radio Church and studying together with us. We just pray the Lord's richest blessings on you. And we will be back next Sunday morning on FOJC Radio Church. And we're going to have a couple songs here to just spend a little time with Him. May the Lord bless you. And we will see you next week. Austin duplicated, never replicated. You're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network. Blue Raven Network. KBLU Radio Network. Blue Raven Network. Visit our website at www.oneblueraven.weebly.com.
KBLU Radio Network, Blue Raven Network, visit our website at www.blueraven.weebly.com. Broadcasting live from the high desert southwest out here in the Rockies. You're listening to the all new KBLU radio network, Blue Raven Network. Thank you for listening. Often duplicated, but never replicated. You're listening to the all new KBLU Radio Network. That's the Blue Raven Network. Yes, you got it tuned in to the right radio station. You're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network. Often duplicated, but never replicated. Often duplicated, never replicated. You're listening to the all-new KBLU Radio Network. Blue Raven Network.